Hello, I'm Bill Kinney, and this is my 120th video on problem solving for financial math for actuarial exam 2. Most of the problems we've done have been from the Mathematics of Investment and Credit, 6th edition by Samuel Broverman, though some of the problems have been from the Theory of Interest, 2nd edition by Stephen Kellison. Recently, we've talked about Chapter 4 from Broverman's book, which is about bonds, including finding yield rates for bonds using financial functions on calculators like this, like the BA2 Plus from Texas Instruments. Now in Chapter 5, we're doing that in more general settings. We're finding yield rates, in this case the internal rate of return, IRR, which is really effectively a yield rate, um, for more general transactions, not just involving bonds, but also in this case involving stocks. So we're doing problem 5.1.3 find the internal rate of return, IRR, for a transaction involving stock purchases, sales, and dividend payments. It's a simplified version of an example in Bergman's book where also commissions are paid. Here we get rid of the commissions. So what's the situation? Smith, the person, is buying a thousand shares of stocks at a certain price. Five per share, we won't specify the monetary unit. Of course, in general, it could be dollars or euros or pounds or whatever. Um, and then, so what does that mean? So Smith is buying shares in a company, a corporation. He is going to be a part owner then of that corporation and possibly if the corporation is doing well, at least get some dividends. If the corporation is doing well, they often pay their investors in their stocks dividends. And that's what's happening. Six months later, he receives a cash dividend of 0.20 per share, per share so that'll be 200, 0.2 times 1,000. But he's not going to just take that home. He's going to immediately reinvest it, buy more shares at a price of four per share. Uh, so since he's getting two hundred in money, and the price, the new price of the stock is four per share. Stock prices go up and down over time, all the time. Two hundred divided by four is fifty. So he's going to buy fifty more shares. Six months after that, he buys another five hundred shares at a different price. 450 per share. Finally, six months after that, he receives another cash dividend of 0.25 per share and also sells all of his existing shares at a higher price now of 5 per share. The goal now is to find Smith's internal rate of return, which again is effectively a yield rate, for the entire transaction in the form I2 as a nominal annual yield rate. Though I should warn you, in the back of the book, in Broverman's book, and also even in the Solutions Manual, the answer is given as J, the effective semi-annual return, instead of I2, a nominal annual return, which doesn't is not consistent with the example this comes from. The example asks for I2 instead of J. Um, we will find both. We'll find J, and we'll also double it to find I2. All right, so let's think about this with a timeline. This is going to be time. It would make the most sense, I think, since these transactions are every six months, for the time to be in half years. <coughs> so we have time zero when the stock is initially bought, time one when the cash dividend is paid and when more shares are bought, time two six months later when 500 more shares are bought, and then time three when another dividend is paid and then when all the existing shares are sold. Let's write the dollar amounts or the, the money amounts as uh, outgoing money or incoming money with a sign, with a negative sign for outgoing money and a positive sign for income on incoming money to Smith. So initially when Smith buys the thousand shares at five per share, that means five thousand is the amount of money going out. So I write a minus 5,000. This is going to be helpful to keep track of the signs here. And at that time then, Smith is going to have 1,000 shares right after he buys it. At time one, six months later, he's getting a dividend of 0.20 per share. 1,000 times 0.2 is 200. So that's incoming money. However, he immediately uses that money, it becomes outgoing money, to buy more shares. So the net change in uh, money going on here, the transaction, is effectively zero. He does have more shares though now. Now he gets 50 more shares, is up to 1,050 shares. 
right? Again, 1,000 times 0.2 is 200. 200 divided by 4 is 50. 1,000 plus 50 is 1,050. So that's how many shares he's got. Six months later, uh, he's going to buy another 500 shares at 450 per share. 500 shares at 450 per share is negative 2,250. That's a negative because it's outgoing money. He's buying 500 more shares, so 1,050 plus 500 is 1,550 shares. That's how much he has after that transaction. Finally, at time three, there's the, the dividend of 0.25 per share, so take 1,550 times 0.25. The dividend amount is 387.50 as a positive amount going back to Smith. And then Smith decides to sell all his 1,550 shares for five per share. So now also take 1,550 times five plus 7,750. So the total amount that Smith gets here at time three, which is a year and a half later, is 7,750 plus 387.5 comes out to 8,000. 137.50. All right, so that's the setup. Now, what is this internal rate of return, IRR, which again is effectively a yield rate? It's going to be, let's initially take it as J, the effective semi annual IRR. It's going to be that rate at which the um, present value of the outgoing money and the present value of the incoming money is the same. Okay, just like yield rates for bonds, for example. So we can write down an equation of value. If we let V be one over one plus J, we can think of it in terms of present values. We can write down the PV of the outgoing money is 5,000, that's at time zero, it does not need to get discounted, uh, plus 2250 times V squared, 2250 is at time two, it needs to go back two half years. This was zero, I don't need to include it in this equation. And that should be the present value of the incoming money. The 8137.50, needs to get discounted back to time zero, so multiplied by V cubed. So this would be the equation to solve for V, and then you could uh, use this fact to solve for J, and then double it to solve for I2. Um, and certainly you, you can solve this. Um, there's even a formula for how to solve cubics involving square roots and cube roots. It's, you know, practically nobody remembers that formula. But we want to use the financial functions in the calculator, and we do want to re-emphasize that we got outgoing money thought of as negative amounts and incoming money thought of as positive amounts. So effectively what I'm going to do is I'm going to subtract 5,000 and subtract 2250V squared from both sides to get zero on one side. And then I'll also switch around the order of things here. I'll put the non-zero thing, or the the symbols and the numbers on the left side and zero on the right side. So I'd have negative 5,000 minus 2250V squared plus 8137.50V cubed equals zero. So these two equations are equivalent. They're going to have the same solutions. We are after a V that hopefully is a little less than a one. Um, let's use the financial functions now in the calculator to solve for V, or to solve for J actually is what, is what it's going to give us. Um, we've done that before with bonds. But now I want to do the more general situation with these cash flows. And the first thing to do is actually press the CF button, standing for cash flow. It's going to effectively bring us into a little mini spreadsheet inside the calculator, CF. First thing you want to do is clear it out. Um, the negative 5,000 is correct. It is the amount that goes there. But in general, you want to clear this out. You want to clear the work. You can see above the this button down there, press second, clear work, clear it out. That's the typical thing you want to do right away. But now I am going to put the negative 5,000 in there. 
in for the cash flow at time zero as a negative amount because it's outgoing money. You do need to hit enter. You want to see an equal sign come in here. Press enter and now you see CF0 equals negative 5,000. Now we want to tab downward through this spreadsheet so I want to press this down arrow button. C01 is the um, cash flow at time one uh, which is actually going to be zero this zero here and you do want to enter that zero even though I didn't write it here so I want to hit enter here to get zero stored in C01 tab down you see F01 which means frequency 01 which is how many payments of that C01 do you make typically we can just keep this at one let's not worry about it all the F's are going to equal one C01 2 is the cash flow at time 2. Uh, that's going to be the negative 2250. Type neg 2250 negative and enter. Make sure you hit enter so you see the equal sign there. It's now stored. Tab down, make, keep F02 at 1. Tab down, C03 is now the 813750. That says a positive amount is coming back to you. Enter that. Now it's stored. Now we are ready to compute IRR. Hit IRR, internal rate of return, then press CPT for compute. And there it is, four point, it's giving it to you as a percent, 4.93%. And that is the value of J. J is 4.93%, and actually the back of the book in Roberman gives 4.9301%. However, that's not the best answer according to the directions because in the example that this mimics without the commissions, the answer is supposed to be in the form I2 as a nominal annual rate. This is an effective semi-annual rate. I2 would be what I get by doubling J. Multiply this by 2. 9.8602% would be the corresponding nominal annual rate, internal rate of return, or you again, you could call it the yield rate too. That's They're basically synonyms. Uh, before I end the video, I want to spend some time uh, thinking about what's going on here graphically. I've got a graphing calculator as well here. Now, you can't use the graphing calculator on the exam, but that's okay. We can certainly use it on the video to try to understand what's going on better here. And if I go to my y equals screen, what I've done here is in y1, I've typed effectively the function representing uh, this thing right here, this function of v. I typed, you can see negative 5,000 minus 2250 x squared is like v squared. Tab over, you see a plus 8137.5 times x cubed. The x is playing the role of v. The solution we found is a little bit, uh, for j, is a little bit bigger than zero. For v, it's going to be a little less than one. If I now want to graph this, I can pick a window like x going between zero and 1.2. The thing we want to really focus on, though, is it should have an intercept a little less than one. I'm picking a wide range of values for y here. I guess I should pick a bigger scale here to see the tick marks more nicely. I can graph this as a function of v, and it looks like this, and you can see it does look like it's crossing the axis. This is 1.2 over there. There's one close to there. It's crossing a little less than one as it should. Let's zoom in on that. I'll go from 0.9 to one, and let's make the y window go from negative 10 to 10. And I can see crossing, yes, this is 0.9, this is one. It's crossing close to 0.95. It looks almost vertical on the scale. It's it's not, of course. I can calculate that intercept, that zero. I'll uh, give a left bound, 0.9489. Give a right bound, say this, and a guess, 0 0.9530154 is what the calculator is saying for the value of v. 0.9530154. So let's find the corresponding j. Take 1 divided by 0 0.9530154.
and subtract 1, we get j is 0 0.049301. Yes, that is matching. 4.9301%. Let's do one more thing. This is all worth doing, I think. Let's um, multiply that equation by negative 1 plus j cubed to write an equivalent equ equation involving j. That would be positive 5,001 plus j cubed plus 2250 times 1 plus j, right? b squared times 1 plus j cubed is going to be 1 plus j plus 81, uh, minus, excuse me, minus 8137.50 v cubed times 1 plus j cubed is just 1 equals 0. I could think of this thing as a function of j if I liked and graph it, and hopefully it has a root just barely bigger than zero at 0 0.049301. Let's see if that happens on the graphic, graphing calculator as well. And let's get rid of this one and go down to this one. And this is what we've got here. 5,000 times 1 plus x cubed is the same as 1 plus j cubed plus 2250 times 1 plus x minus 81.37.50. There we go. Let's graph this on a different window, now close to 0. x goes from 0 to 0 0.1, say. Let's just try that and see what happens. And there we go. Looks like the intercept is close to 0 0.05, as it should be. Let's go ahead and calculate it. Left bound, say right there, right bound, say right there, guess. There we go, 0 0.049301, okay? Same thing, 4.9301%. So this is a yield rate or internal rate of return, IRR, for this situation. Um, and hope you got a lot of, out of that.